Hello everyone, haven't done a sit down video for so long, and welcome back to today's highly requested BME Q&A video. I have received a lot of questions regarding my BME content, and thank you so much for your involvement, and today I will try my best to answer your questions. So I've categorized all these questions into four general categories. The first one is funding and budget schools. The second is subdivisions and courses. Third, career outlook and growth. Fourth, BME PhD and MD programs. I have made videos about what are the top industries for BME grads, how to get entry-level lab roles, and what my offer letter looks like working at my current position in healthcare. Make sure you check those out before or after today's video because I've already included a ton of details and free PDF resources for you. And without further ado, let's get into today's first category, funding and budget schools. First of all, I just wanted to let you know that all the following information is focused in the United States. And before budget schools, I want to share what I know about funding for graduate programs and above so that you know where the money comes from and how to get the free money before even spending your own. Generally, PhD programs are fully funded, maybe completely by your PI or principal investigator or a combination of the school and your PI. Also, another important note is that this is probably unique to the U.S. education system where students can apply for PhD programs directly out of undergrad without a master's degree. So basically, if you get into a PhD program in the U.S., you'll get free education and also some stipend for working as a research assistant or RA or teaching assistant or TA. And the fundings for PhD program is prioritized over all other degree types. And again, that's generally speaking, PhD programs are fully funded. However, it doesn't apply to all PhD programs. I know some of my PhD friends, they are not fully funded, but they do pay in-state tuition, which is like two or three times lower if you were to pay in full. However, if you're going for a master's degree, don't lose all your hope yet. There is still funding or scholarship for master's students, but it will just be a lot more competitive. As you know by now, most funding is allotted or prioritized for the PhD students. And about scholarships, usually the school or department will automatically award a certain amount to you with your initial offer, usually a few thousand dollars, if they don't specify that you need to submit a separate application for that. But honestly, in my opinion, if you don't get full or even half of the scholarship, a few thousand dollars isn't that much helpful if the tuition is 30, 40 grand. But still, something is better than nothing. And in this case, the best chance for you to substantially reduce your tuition is to try your best to get a RA or TA or a graduate assistantship or GA ship. Well, at this point, you'll probably know that most RA and TA roles are given to the PhD students, but there are indeed a small amount of positions open for master's students, which takes luck and efforts to find and get it. But I won't be going too much in details about it today because that could be a whole another topic just about how to contact the professors and so on. But hey, here's the good news. Graduate assistantship or GA ship is quite available for any graduate students. So this type of assistantship usually involves positions such as working as an assistant in the school library or assistant in just about any sort of uh, school or department offices like IT, sustainability, literally anything. And usually if you get GA ship, that will also qualify you for in-state tuition and a stipend. The only thing is that you may not be getting direct or relevant experience for your research. But hey, getting in-state tuition and allowance to just go through school first helps big time. 
And for my friends who have gotten GA ships told me, they either got it automatically at a mission or introduced by their supervisor at the beginning of the semester, or they went door to door to ask each department office. Just because you don't get it in the first semester doesn't mean that you can't get it for the rest of your school years. You just need to always be on the hunt for it. I have friends who have gotten GA ship in their second semester or even the starting of second year. And the last type of funding I want to briefly mention is the merit and need-based financial aid. As much as I know, for any public school, these types of financial aid are mainly for US students if you meet the qualifications because most of the money comes from the federal government and local states. And for private schools, however, they may not care too much about your residency status. So if you are an international student, I think for merit-based scholarships, you probably need to showcase significant achievements. And for need-based scholarships, I think there's a small chance international students will get a significant amount of it or even at all. I personally don't know too much about this type of funding in depth and I don't happen to know any of my friends who have gotten it. And I don't mean to discourage anyone from applying for this type of aid if you think you stand a chance. Definitely take your shot by all means. Please do share your experience if you happen to receive this type of rewards to help other people understand it more. With all the above, I hope you'll spend some time to decide which pathway, PhD or Masters that you are going to go for because that'll help you get a good estimate about how much more money you need to go through school. I definitely don't claim to know everything about funding and different types of scholarships and assistantships because there's just too much nuances in each of them. And I welcome everyone to share with the rest of us if you happen to know anything else other than what I've covered and we will greatly appreciate that. Okay, next I'm gonna share what I know about budget schools if for any reason that you are not going for a PhD program or haven't yet gotten any assistantship. There are so many schools in the USA and to be more focused and increase my chance, I would personally do what is called the process of elimination and that is to eliminate any brand names, private schools and any high cost of living cities which you can easily find from just a simple Google search. And in general, I find more budget schools located, including but not limited to these states, such as the Great Plains states like South Dakota, North Dakota, Nevada, Montana, and Midwest and Central states like Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Southern states like Florida, Texas, Tennessee, Alabama, and etc. And today I will just introduce a few of them to get you started right away. Oh, and also I want to let you know that the program names don't have to just be biomedical engineering. Many schools have program names like bioengineering, biochemical engineering, etc. And I personally won't stress about the program names so much as long as you can find research that you are interested in doing. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's get started with our first school. So the first school I'm going to talk about is North Dakota State University. This is their College of Engineering webpage. Moving down, you can see they offer three types of degree programs, BS, MS, and PhD. Clicking into one of them, and you can see this is the admission requirements and financial assistance. And this webpage is for their graduate tuition and student fees. Um, you can just select uh, which category fits you. International students, base tuition, 737. Um, and U.S. residents is 632. And usually for graduate students, the full-time hour is 9. So you can quickly do the math for yourself to see how much you need. The next university I'm going to talk about is University of South Florida and this is their webpage for Department of Medical Engineering and you can see they have um, MS in Biomedical Engineering and PhD programs. Okay, 
and for MS, they have subdivisions such as biomedical imaging and bioelectronics, cell and tissue engineering, molecular medicine and drug delivery, and so on. Okay, now let's take a quick look of the tuition. Moving down, I think USF has a few different campuses, so you'll probably need to look at the specific one. So for this one, for Florida residents, it's about three forty-seven per credit, and for non-Florida residents, it's about four thirty-one per credit. That's really low. This might be the school I would look into further. The last university I'm going to talk about today is the University of Toledo. I believe it is in Ohio. Okay, this is their bioengineering webpage. For their graduate programs, they offer master in bioengineering and doctor in biomedical engineering. And here you can see what kind of research focus they have for bioengineering and biomedical engineering. What kind of labs they have here. And current research going on. And lastly, let's take a look at how much they charge for tuition. So this is the graduate tuition for in-state, which is seventy-six, seventy-seven, and for、um, out-of-state students, it's over thirteen grants. So for tuition, in my opinion, anything that's less than fifteen thousand or twenty thousand, I think it's pretty good. And also remember what I've said earlier about RA, GA, and TA ship. So if you qualify for any of those, you'll either get in-state tuition or tuition is completely waived. All right, that's everything I can think of for now in terms of funding and budget schools. And now I'll be moving forward to talk about the BME subdivisions and courses. And honestly, I've talked about that in great details in this video, so make sure you check that out after this one. People have asked me what subdivisions or courses to choose to be more ready for a future career in the field, and obviously that really depends on what you are passionate about doing, and your interests might be different than mine. But what I can tell you is that what are the highly desirable skills for biotech, pharmaceutical, healthcare to set you off for a smoother transition. So when you are choosing a subdivision or a course, focus on building these skills through lab work, research, and projects. I think what the employers care a lot about is what have you actually done, and what kind of results have you produced, no matter how small they are, rather than what courses you've taken. And in terms of skills, I'm going to talk about three main categories. Wet lab instruments and dry lab. So wet lab skills are anything that involves using reagents, basic lab tools like pipettes, in a biosafety hood, and this include but not limited to cell culture, qPCR, CRISPR, mass spectrometry, flow cytometry, Western blotting, protein expression and purification, enzyme-linked immunoassays. Molecular cloning and gel electrophoresis, and the next category is instrumentation, and that is the kind of devices, tools, machines that you use. There are just too many to even name. But what I have used a lot in grad school is SEM or scanning electron microscopy and fluorescent microscopy. And the last category I want to mention is the dry lab techniques, which include things like using different types of software programs for data analysis, like CAD, MATLAB,、uh, SolidWorks, Galaxy, R, Python, SQL, etc. And all of these lab techniques, of course, are really dependent on the types of research that you do. Definitely no pressure about knowing everything. My wet lab techniques from grad school is actually quite limited, so I only know cell culture, tissue harvesting, and cryopreservation. And I don't have a ton of experience in many software programs, but just knowing a few techniques from each category could get you pretty far in terms of getting a entry level role after graduation. All right, moving on to the next topic: BME career outlook and growth rate. 
In terms of career outlook, I've talked about the top industries and how to search for job titles in this video. Make sure to check that out and I won't be repeating myself too much in this one. And in terms of the growth rate, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics or BLS, the growth rate for BME is about 5% from 2022 to 2032, faster than the average for all occupations. And from the UC Davis BME News, it says that it's about 6% from 2020 to 2030, and it equates to about 1,400 job openings each year. Maybe having the engineer in the title is still a privilege, but I personally think that a 5 to 6% growth rate is just not that fast. And after many months searching for a job after graduation, just makes me want to believe that even more. And if we compare BME to a few of other types of engineering growth rate, by the way, all of these data is from BLS, with chemical engineering at 8%, industrial engineering at 12%, mechanical engineering at 10%, and software engineering at 25%. So BME growth rate is on the lower side amongst other engineering. If I tell you I never have regrets selecting BME, I would be lying because no matter how much I want to contribute to making healthcare better, I have to be able to sustain myself too. But there is indeed one area in BME that in my opinion is very golden in terms of job growth and the average pay, and that is bioinformatics, which is the intersection of computer programming, big data, and biology. According to this one article from Northeastern EDU, computer-based analysis of which bioinformatics is a subset are projected to grow 22% by 2030, with average salary shown in this picture. And lastly, I just want to quickly answer an international viewer's question about BME PhD and MD program. This dual degree program allows medical students the opportunity for in-depth training in engineering and technology relevant to clinic and translational research. I've heard this is the best value way to get an MD degree without paying the MD tuition because PhD programs are generally funded, but not for medical school. And according to my quick search on Google, US med school accept international applicants, but it's not common. Some US medical schools accept and matriculate a small amount of international applicants into their programs or accept undergraduate degree from another country. This is a very case-by-case -case scenario and you'll have to look into the requirements of which schools that you are applying to. But I do think international students stand a bigger chance if you complete all your post-high school education in the US. But anyways, that's how much I know about it. Let me know if y'all have other questions and I'll do another Q&A session. And I hope all the above is helpful to you in some shape or form and have a good one.